you ever found yourself in a situation you can't find a way out? Doesn't seem like there's a way out. It can be at work, be at home, you can be in the church. Where you just, uh, no matter what you do, it doesn't seem like there's an escape. Maybe your fight or flight uh, reaction kicks in and you get angry and you, you want to fight. Maybe you get that elevated heart rate and you can't catch your breath and then you just feel like you just want to run. You don't have a place to go. You don't have anywhere in mind that you want to run to. You just feel like you need to get away. And it's bad enough when you find yourself in that situation because it's your own fault. You, you based on your decisions, you've landed yourself in this tough spot. I don't know, maybe worse when it, it, you can't blame yourself. Others' actions, others, others' deeds, you found yourself suffering consequences that aren't really yours to bear. That's where we find the subject of our lesson this morning, Lot. We've looked at Abel and some of the, some of the consequences of Abel's faithful and righteous worship. Becoming the first martyr in the name of God. And then we see Noah, who him and his family was delivered through water on the ark away from the filth and sinfulness of a world that the Bible describes as every thought and intent was evil continually. The bad place that Noah had to live in. He didn't choose to place his family in that situation. It was the time and place that he was born into and he was given a job and he did it. And he was successful and was faithful and righteous for it. Lot, though, he's a different story. He chose to pitch his tent in the valley of the Jordan. And he chose to move closer and closer to that city that was known to him to be a bad place, Sodom. One of these cities in this valley that were ultimately destroyed, Sodom and Gomorrah. I read a commentary this week that said that maybe perhaps these cities were where the Dead Sea is now. I don't know that that's the case. There's never any evidence that that's the case to my knowledge. But it would be kind of fitting in a place where it's now barren and nothing grows in that, that I guess it's a lake, sea, dead sea. There's nothing that can grow in it because it's so salty. But Lot chose to live where he lived. In a place that he knew was a bad place. A place bad enough that I don't know that I've ever been in a city like where Lot lived. We lived up in St. Louis, as you know, and, and there was a place that me and Aaron uh, visited accidentally. East St. Louis, on the other side of the river, the other side of the Mississippi River in Illinois. And that was a place that everybody said, you don't, you don't go to East St. Louis. You don't go there during the day, much less during the night. It's a bad place. It's a violent place. And maybe you could compare what happened in this example in Genesis chapter 19 to what happened to these, these two men that are identified in 19, but earlier on were identified as angels with the word of God, the angel of the Lord, God himself that went and spoke with Abraham. And Abraham is negotiating with God, and that's a different lesson for a different day. But we see these two angels come to the city. And we find Lot distressed. And I want to I start off with that because Lot gets a bad rap. He made some bad choices. Probably shouldn't have lived in Sodom. He shouldn't have, maybe, maybe he could have worked out a way to, to stay with Abraham. And in the commentaries I was looking at, when you look through Bible class material, going all the way back to when I was a kid, Lot's kind of the bad guy in these stories, and Abraham's the good guy. But when you consider Abraham's life and some of the choices that he made, he found himself in equally tough situations. And so it's interesting to me to read in 2 Peter, as we read this morning, or was it 1 Peter? 2 Peter 2, there we go. That Lot's identified 
as a righteous man. His righteous deeds, his righteous life, his righteous soul being tormented by the, the wickedness that's around him. Because it was, it was Lot there at the city gates in chapter 19 of Sodom when he sees these two men coming. And I don't, I don't know that they're ever identified in chapter 19 to Lot as being angels. But I can't help but think that the actions that he has, he, he knows who they are. He knows what they are. He knows what they're about. And his concern is genuine. It's also alarming. As we look here in Genesis 19, as this story unfolds, and he sees these men approach and they say, well, we're just going to sleep here in the city square. No, 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 no. You're not going to. You're going to come and stay with me. You don't, trust me, want to stay in the city square. And we find out exactly why. But even in one of the, the nastiest places in the country, St. Louis, I don't know that what happened to Lot and his house and those two men were, it was even something that would happen in any city in America. There might be places in the world like something like this would happen, but I don't know about in America. Because as they come into the house and Lot sort of offers his home to these men, the men of the city, it says there, I believe it's in verse 4, know that they're there. And they're identified uh, as the whole, the whole city of men come out. I'm trying to see. I didn't write it down. Yes, verse 4. All right, all right. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of, the, of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. I don't know that that's literally every single man in the city came out, but the idea is, is that it wasn't just a few people. It wasn't just a specific group of men, young men, teenagers, street youths, but it was all kinds of men, young and old, from all parts of the city came and surrounded the house. And called out, hey, send those two guys out to us so that we may know them. Now, I know the NIV is more explicit in what they were wanting. They wanted to know them physically. And that's alarming. That this would happen to a house. That, that there would be people that would come and surround a house and would be this, this forceful. And it gets worse as Lot goes out to meet these people and he, he tries to talk reason to them. He tries, hey, brethren, he identifies. Hey, brethren, countrymen, friends, don't do this wickedness. They come into my house. And here's where I, I believe that, that Lot, he makes a really bad choice. He makes a very terrible decision that I don't, I don't know that we can wrap our minds around because I, I can't. I can't find myself in this in his shoes. I hope that I never do. But Lot tries to negotiate. Look, I've got two virgin daughters. Have them instead. But don't take these guys. What? You're going to offer up your, your daughters to this rabble? They don't take too kindly for it. What are you? Are you some sojourner? You're some guy that came into town. You're not from Sodom. You don't, you're not, you don't look like us. You don't talk like us. You didn't grow up here. You're going to stand in judgment. We're going to do worse to you than we're going to do to the two guys. I don't know what would be worse than what they had planned, but that's what the threat was here in 19. And so they start to press in on him. And you can almost get the feeling that it's, it's dark. Maybe some torches flickering around town. Maybe there's a big fire in the center of town to, to light this, the streets. And, and this group of men set on rape start to press in on Lot. And he's backing up. And then his door opens, and these two angels pull him inside and close the door. And then they, the whole group of men are struck blind. And it says that they wearied themselves with groping at the door, looking for the way in. 
It's a bad scene. This is a, a disturbing scene in, in a very early part of the Bible. And yet, we see God being righteous here. As we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they stand as an example throughout the Bible as the worst place. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus tells those, uh, his disciples as they're going out, hey, uh, you know what? If, if they don't accept the word from you, my word, shake the dust of the road off your feet, and it's going to be worse for them in the last than it is for Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, they, this city stands, these, these, these cities of this plain stand as a, a, a testament, an example of what's bad and the consequences of what is bad. And specifically, the actions of the people in the city is just so... It, it's not even, we can't comprehend it, I don't believe. It's so terrible. What happened? It's like, this really happened. And so there, there's Lot and his family in the house, and these men say, look, you got to get back. you got to get out. After they strike them blind... Um, the men said to him in verse 12, have you seen anyone else here? Or excuse me, have you had anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So in verse 14, I, this is comical, but in a way it's tragic. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. I think we can kind of understand that happening, though. That we we preach the truth and people think that we're joke, joking. Yeah, that's not going to happen. you crazy. That's not the truth. That's not the God of love. He's not going to destroy you. He won't send anybody to hell. Are you crazy? But you mean you know, all you have to do is be baptized? No. No, you just have to accept him into your heart. God's not going to send me to hell just because I wasn't dumped in water. That's silly. I mean, certainly, we can certainly understand that. And so these men that, that, that Lot's warning, hey, God's better get out. The whole place is going to get, get ready to be destroyed. I thought he was joking. And yet he still lingered until the morning comes. Or just before morning. And the angels are like, you've got to go. You've got to get out unless you're caught up in the destruction. And he still lingered. And so it says that they took them by force, by the hand, and led them to the city gates. And they said, you've got to run and don't look back. And Lot still says, well, I can't run to the hills. Look, there's a little town. Can we go over there? And now, when you look at this scene there at the last part of the chapter, you might scratch your head and think, well, how ungrateful. You can't just follow one simple instruction, run to the hill. Why do you got to negotiate on the brink of destruction how you're going to be saved? And yet that little town was saved because of Lot. Don't know that that was the reason he wanted to go there. But Lot flees with his family in tow. But what happens to Lot's wife? It's kind of a, a motto. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife who, what, just turned into a pillar of salt? Is that what we remember, the, 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 the salt monument of Lot's wife? Or is it what she did to look back at home is what it was for her, I believe. To look back at, not to, to revel in the destruction of a city, but maybe to look back at what she had. The life of prosper that she had, the life, I don't know, of wickedness, the life of ease, of friends, friendship with the world. Remember Lot's wife. We're going to stop with Lot's life at the end of this chapter. God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroys the, the cities of this Jordan plain completely and utterly. Lot goes on 
and lives his life. Nations are born from Lot in an incestual relationship with his two daughters. We're not going to talk so much about that. That's the last I'm going to mention this. But as we, as we look at this example of Lot, and we don't really, we're not told a whole lot. We know that he follows Abraham out of Ur. Abraham's called to leave his father's house and to go to a land which I'll show you. And he brings Lot with him. And then we see Lot's men quarreling with Abraham's men. And so they separate and Lot's given a choice. And you can't, can you really blame him for taking the best one? I mean, maybe Abraham was the kind of guy where if he's offering you something, hey, you want the, the really old car or do you want a new car? Well, Abraham, I think I'll take the old car. No, you don't want that. I'll take that. You take a new car. Maybe Abraham was that kind of guy. But Lot takes flack for a lot of things. He takes flack for taking the best of the two choices, which, you know, can you really blame him? He's blamed for moving into the city, which that, that was, you know, probably a bad choice, objectively. Especially if you knew what was going on. But we see him acting in righteous, faithful ways. We see him leading with Abraham and believing in the word of God. We see him leaving when he's told to, eventually, anyway. He's taken, almost like Jude says, you know, stack, snatching them from the flames. I mean, this is almost the, exactly what's happening here. Lot, you got to leave and you're not moving fast enough, so we're going to frog march you out of the city to save you. Lot's accredited here with being righteous. As God is punishing sinners, Lot is faithful and righteous. But it's not because Lot did anything special. He wasn't righteous because he was uh, righteous on his own deeds. He was made righteous the way we all are made righteous in God. Because the story here in chapter 19 isn't a story about God punishing evil, and it is. But when we look below the surface, when we look surrounding this scene here, as Abraham is there before God, and God's renewing the covenant with Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis. And, and God says, I'm going to give all of this land to you. You're going to go here and there, and you're going to check things out. It's going to be an inheritance to your children, but not for you. Because they're going to come back in the fourth generation. Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. You see, the, the sin here in Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin in these cities, it wasn't unlawful the way forgetting the Sabbath day or eating a, a BLT was for the Jews. Because that was the law. There, there was no law of Moses to break at this time. The iniquity, though, it, that, that it talks about, this iniquity of the Amorites, and that would be those living in Canaan, Sodom and Gomorrah specifically at this point here. But in 400 years, it's going to be bad to where I'm going to send you in and you're going to destroy them all. But these people, these Amorites specifically, were bad enough now to be destroyed. And it's a much more basic than just being unlawful under the word of God. It was sin against the very basic nature of man that was going on here. It was being sinful to the point where you know, you know something's wrong just because you know it's wrong. That's what they were, that was the law they were breaking. They were breaking this moral law that they should have known. The people that got off the ark were still alive. They should have known what God does to sinners. And yet, in a very short amount of time, they found themselves being bad enough again for God to send complete and utter destruction down. And only saved three people from the city. God is righteous. God is merciful. Lot walked with the man that was a friend of God. He had a choice of where to live. And maybe he made the bad choice. Maybe he made a poor living decision there. But we do see him concerned with those who came to see him. And wanting to protect them. And we find him in this, this moment of distress. Of not knowing what to do. 
Not wanting to leave, not wanting it to be true that God's getting ready to destroy all these people that he's known. And so eventually, these men who came to search out the city take him and remove him. I think Lot was a righteous man because the Bible tells me so, but when we consider his actions, he made some bad choices, but don't we all? Don't we all make bad choices? Because God knows how to deliver the godly from the unrighteous. As we read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5-9 through nine this morning, God delivered Noah through water. He delivered Lot through fire. What would have happened if Lot had stayed living there? I don't know. I think the taint of those cities, though, stayed with his children based on their actions. Lot delayed, but was eventually saved because God is merciful. And God is able to make us righteous today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5-10 through 10. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the word... The world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The earth was destroyed once in the flood of Noah. When it happens again, it'll be forever. It'll be done, complete. But do not overlook this one fact in verse 8, beloved. That with the Lord one day is a thousand years and is a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a war and with the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are, in, that are done in it. And I like the way the ESV reads here. Will be exposed. Will be found. That there's no secret. There's nothing that you do that's going to remain private. That there is ultimately going to be a come a day when the godly will be rewarded. And those who are wicked will receive their just punishment. God is merciful. And he doesn't want anybody to perish. He waited in the days of Noah for Noah to build the ark. He waited for Lot to get out of the city. The Lord is merciful. If we are doing what we're supposed to, He will be merciful to us. There is always a way of escape. Lot maybe made some poor choices, but Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the last scripture, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God is merciful. We know where the escape is. We can escape a life of sin. And we can escape an eternity in hell through the waters of baptism. We talked about the ark last week. Getting on the boat. Are you staying in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? Or are you going to get out? Don't linger. Don't like Lot's wife look back. Come out of the city. There's always a way of escape. Won't you come as we stand here?